Well, since we're since I'll be preaching on the Holy Spirit today, it's probably fitting that we can see and experience and feel Him with us. Amen. Amen. Welcome to our church this morning. We're glad that you're here. Do you feel the Spirit this morning? I definitely do. I definitely do. Uh, we are especially glad if you are a visitor with us this morning. Hope you feel the Holy Spirit, but also hope you feel the love of Christ and the love of his people. Uh, you know, that's um, our goal. I, I really believe, I, and I, if this is your first Sunday, um, I guess the proof is in the pudding, as they say, but I believe that we are a loving church. Um, and, and I know so many of you that uh, an example of that, we, the funeral that I did last week, and we didn't, most of us did not know this person who had passed away, and I put out a plea for food and servants, and we were flooded with food and servants, and, and uh, so I just, that just blesses me to see you guys being the hands and feet of Jesus. Glad that you are here. If you are visiting with us this morning, uh, there is a blue card in the seat pocket in front of you. I uh, invite you to fill that out and leave it in the, in the seat there when you leave today. You do not have to do that, but we really uh, would love to know that you were here. You know, um, one of the things as we get bigger as a church, um, and I, I, I mean this with all my heart, it, it grieves me that I don't know every single person and every single child by name. It grieves me. And, and, and the bigger we get... Especially, the, well, let me, let me rephrase it. The bigger we get and the older I get, it's kind of, they work together. Uh, it's harder to do that, but I want to know you, and our people want to know you. So um, uh, just encourage you. Also, I'm going to take this opportunity on, the, on name tags. Everybody's ducking under the seats. You know what's funny is everybody wants a name tag, but nobody wants to wear them. Isn't that something? Let's wear our name tags. So that we can get to know each other by name. So, uh, but glad that you're here. Um, uh, if you would turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. If you've never read through the book of Acts, I encourage you to do it. It's, it's a great book. Um, Acts chapter 1, we're going to pick it up in verse 4. Now, um, I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture today, but um, we'll pick it up, Acts 1, chapter 4. Now, this Jesus has gone to the cross. He's, he's been uh, resurrected, and he's spending his last moments with the disciples before he uh, descends back to the Father. And uh, so let's see what he is telling them, what he is teaching them, and what uh, he is preparing them for. On one occasion while he, and speaking of Jesus, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Now notice he didn't say he gave them this suggestion, but he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. I'm going to read that again. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. If you would, skip down to Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be... Now, now, now I'm going to stop for just a second. After, after the Holy Spirit came, filled them with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues, and the, the people there in the city were uh, 
curious what's going on. Peter began to preach the gospel to them. He shared what I call the first sermon of the church. And then, uh, so he's just done that in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, speaking to the, uh, to the people there that were listening, and to your children. Anybody ever, if you ever wonder about uh, children being too young to receive Jesus, here it is. It's for you and it's for your children and for all who are far off. And guess who's far off? You and I. He's talking about us. It's more specifically the Gentiles. For all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you, but we've already invited you, and you're already here. We ask you to speak to us. Speak in power and authority. And Lord, we know that the only way you speak is in power and authority. So do what only you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So I conclude the sermon series today, Dear God. We've been answering some questions, uh, questions of the faith. And this may seem like a, a strange question, but the question today that we'll address is, is the power of the Holy Spirit still available to believers today? The answer is yes. If, if the ushers will come forward, we'll close. That's, <laughs> that's really all that needs to be said. Yes, that answers the question. Yes, he is. Now, um, I, was, I was actually speaking with Brother Marv, who's pastored for 40 how many years? Only, only 42. And, and I asked him if he ever run, ran across this, and because I have, and he, he said yes as well, that, that um, there are Christians that believe that the Holy Spirit doesn't act anymore, that that was for the apostles, and... and uh, that he's kind of done his thing, and, and that's it. And, and, if you, and, and my response to that is open up God's Word and read it. That is, as I said in my email, a very, are you ready? Hang on, this is Greek. It's hogwash. <laughs> it just is. Open up God's Word. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said that, that not only was the Holy Spirit going to be with us, but he was going to be what? in us. Every time we did, last week we baptized Joseph. Joseph, I, that was so awesome, dude. And, and, and the thing that we do at the end of our baptism is we invite the Holy Spirit to come and dwell inside of us. That's significant. God himself, God himself dwelling inside of us. Now, so today is actually Pentecost Sunday. Did anybody Google or read up on Pentecost if you didn't know what Pentecost was? Most everybody, well, it's like, we already knew that. <laughs> Pentecost, in the Old Testament, it was kind of a, a, a festival of, the we, of weeks, and it was, a, it was a harvest festival, and that's what was happening in Acts chapter 2. Uh, the, the Jews are coming for this festival, and they're celebrating this festival of the harvest, and um, and as usual, Jesus always changes the script. He did the same thing at the Last Supper, you know, the Passover meal. You know, they're expecting one thing, and Jesus says, you know, no. It's, it's, I'm making all things new. This is new stuff now. So this coming of the, of, the, of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost in the New Testament, we understand that that was that moment of sending of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people will call this the birth of the church, I mean, the birthday of the church, when uh, if you noticed prior to this moment, uh, they're still, they've been listening to Jesus. He's been teaching them before he ascends to the Father. And then after he leaves, all they got is let's have a, let's have a meeting. Let's have a prayer meeting. 
That's all they got. Jesus said, wait here and pray. I'm going to send it. And so they're sitting around. They're just praying. They, there, there is nothing happening in the, uh, in the church. Okay? The, the church has not been launched. But when the Holy Spirit comes, things begin. I love in verse 4 it says, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began. I, I just, that word just jumps out at me. They, they began. And it goes on to say they began to speak in tongues. But I like to just stop it. It began. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began. Without the Holy Spirit, without, without God here with us, well, this is just fellowship. That's all it is. But when the Holy Spirit shows up, things are different. Things happen. People are made whole. And, I, and I'm not talking about just physical healing, but, but uh, emotional healing. People that are just broken and, and, and wounded. God heals hearts through his Holy Spirit. Now, for some reason, I, I think I know the reason. Uh, there's, it's kind of complex. But, but for a lot of reasons, the whole, to talk about the Holy Spirit uh, intimidates us. It, it just does. We're, we're kind of fearful. In fact, Marv was saying this morning as we were chatting about it, it's like even back in the King James, uh, King James language, to, to call it, refer to it as the Holy Ghost there's something, ooh, you know, it's weird. This is weird. And, and we, in our day and age, uh, we, we feel like that it means you've got to roll around on the floor a little bit or, so, or whatever, you know, you, you know, your head spins, whatever. Weird stuff has to happen. That's not, that's not. What the Holy, we're going to get into more uh, specifically what the Holy Spirit does for us. But too often, it intimidates us, and we're afraid. Now, I ran across this fun little deal. You, can, you guys... Is it okay to laugh and have fun at church? Yes. Okay, we're going to have a little fun this morning. All right, here we go. Uh, I ran across these official worship signals that, that we, we, and for some of us, here's the first one. For the rookie, you got the, you got the elbow flap. Everybody do, everybody do these with me. You got the elbow flap. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's, for, that's for rookies. And then, are you got, carry the TV, carry the TV. Are you big screen? You can do the big screen. Everybody, are y'all? Nobody's doing it with me. If you have, you got to do it with me. All right, that's for the rookies. Now let's move on to the next one. This is for intermediate. We got my fish was this big. My fish was this big. And then we got hold the baby, hold the baby. And then you got Mufasa. Anybody seen Lion King? Mufasa. All right, let's go. The pro, you got dueling light bulbs. Everybody do the dueling light bulbs. Dueling light bulbs. And then you got goal posts, but it's got to follow with the heartburn. Goal post, let's do it again. Goal post, followed by the heartburn. Okay. Now, now this, we're going to put this together. The pointer, hatchet, and school room. We got pointer, hatchet, school room. Got to do it together. Pointer, hatchet, school room. All right, one more time. Pointer, hatchet, school room. Y'all are getting good at this. Now, for the expert, it says, warning, Baptist, do not attempt. So, <laughs> Trevor, you're not a Baptist anymore, so you can go with me, man. So we got the village people. Everybody do the village people. Then we got Rocky, and then we got touchdown. Let's put those together. Village people, Rocky, touchdown. Okay. Yeah. Now we know how to be filled with the Spirit, right? You know, I learned this a long time ago in ministry. Now listen to me. This is important. What's happening on the outside is not always indicative of what's happening on the inside. And that, and I, and that works both directions. You can be doing all, the, all of this gyration and nothing happening in here. But you can also be giving her one of these and tears streaming down your cheeks because the Lord is moving in your life. So, so... We get it wrong when we think that all of this stuff means something. Now, it's, there's nothing wrong with raising your hands. There's nothing. In fact, you know, many of you have voted in church and raised your hands many times. <laughs> Just a joke, a bad joke. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with raising your hands. You're doing any of those things that we kind of play with there a little bit. But there's also nothing wrong with not doing that. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is not, something's not going on. I've seen it many times on both directions. So, so how do we know as believers that we are filled with the Holy Spirit? I was asked a few months ago, 
uh, at one of my discovery classes, the person that asked me that is probably here today. Pastor, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? And, and I loved the question because I, I, love, I love saying yes. <laughs> I can pinpoint the moment when I feel like I was filled with the Holy Spirit, when things changed in my life. And, and, that's, and that's different than being just up here believing, just confessing Christ. But, I mean, to, to invite the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, things change when we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. So I want to look at three things uh, more specifically about how we know the, the Holy Spirit is, is among us, is, is in us. Um, the first is that through the Holy Spirit, the believer proclaims Jesus as Lord. Proclaims Jesus as Lord. Now, uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says it this way, Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God... So, so there's someone who is speaking. If, it's, if the Spirit of God is the one speaking, no one says, Jesus be cursed. I mean, we can't curse Jesus if we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, but, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, he's not talking about we cannot say those words, but he's talking about we cannot, we cannot profess him as Lord. He cannot be our Lord unless the Holy Spirit prompts us to respond in that way. So the Holy Spirit, uh, through the Holy Spirit, the believer proclaims Jesus is Lord. And I spoke of this earlier, but in John um, 14, it says, the, the Spirit of truth lives with you, Jesus said, and will be in you. So it's the, it's the Holy Spirit that draws us to him and where we profess him as Lord. It can't be done by being good. It can't be done by our... Uh, just, just having uh, the disciplines in our lives. You know, if I just read the Bible more, you know, then I'll be, a, I'll be a good Christian. I'll be filled with the Holy Spirit. Or if I just go to church more, if I just work more at the food pantry, or if I do, those are good things. All of those are good things. But those things don't lead us to Christ as Lord. It's the Holy Spirit that's drawing us, wooing us unto himself. And he wants to live inside of us. Now, I love the passage where Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. And he's speaking of this door right here. I stand at the door and knock, and he says that anyone who opens the door and invites me in, I will come in. And so if you want the Holy Spirit, if you want, to, if you want that, it, basically what Scripture tells us is ask, invite him in. Invite him to be your Lord. Secondly, through the Holy Spirit, the believer receives gifts and power for the common good. Receives gifts and power for the common good. Now, I, I could preach, I, and I have preached series on the Holy Spirit, but I could preach weeks and weeks and weeks, and we'd never exhaust what we could talk about with the Holy Spirit. So I'm just scratching the surface today. But, but... I want you to understand that, um, that he provides giftedness to his, to his body, giftedness to his believers, and he provides power. Now, and, and they're to, to build up the church. I mean, that, that, there's a purpose to it. It's to, it's to encourage us, to, to bless us. Now, some of the scriptures, uh, Jesus says that uh, he's going to send what the Father has promised, but to stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Who besides me needs me some more power? Anybody else besides me? I mean, just to, just to walk out this life, we need power. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And then he, we read it today, Acts 1.8. You, Jesus said, will receive power. There it is again. When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And then, and then it goes on to say it's not just power so that we can just sit in the corner and glow. He says you will receive power when he comes, comes upon you and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So, so he's empowering us to be his witnesses, to be his ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5, I believe it is, says we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We are his representatives to a hurting world. Now, 
again, I refer back to the funeral last week, and it was, it was uh, the, the funeral that we did. I mean, the, the family was between churches and uh, didn't ha have a place and didn't have anybody to host the meal and so forth. And it's like, you know, what a, uh, what a blessing it was. We had nothing to gain just to love on people. And you guys had nothing to, you had, you know, you bring the casseroles, you bring the desserts, you have, it's not like, well, I knew so-and-so and I want to do that to, you know, honor the family. It's like, no, I just, just want to bless this family. You will be given power so that you might be my witnesses, Jesus said. Now, and here's the other thing, when, we, when we're speaking of gifts, um, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, uh, there are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. So he manifests himself, the spirit does, to us, in us, and he, with giftedness. Now here's the deal about gifts. Um, not, we, none of us have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but all of us have some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I want to say that again. None of us have all of them, but we all have some of them. If you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you have a gift or gifts from the Holy Spirit. Now, what's, what is significant? One, one of the things to recognize, I know there's all si kinds of ways you can do little tests and try to determine, and, and those are okay and they're good. But what I, what I have a tendency to think is things, when, when God gifts us, he also gives us a passion for, for that giftedness because he, he, he wants us to use it. So if you have a passion to pray, <laughs> you know, perhaps God has made you an intercessor, given you that gift of intercession for others. If you have a, a passion, some people are up front people and some people are behind the scenes people. Not one is not more significant than the other. Some people, you know, that just, just a, a, they, they write little notes. I'm not a real good note writer. I wish I was more, uh, more of that. But some people just, just a gift of encouragement. In, in, in the behind-the-scenes people, we had a, a church I used to attend years ago. They had a program for a while. I don't know if they still do. Uh, it was called Angel Unaware. And every once in a while, you'd be sitting along, and you'd, you'd just, you know, in a lady's purse or something, there'd just you'd be a note, and you'd be like, where'd that come from? And they lifted up and said, I'm praying for you today, or God loves you, or some, just some little encouragement. So, so there's, sometimes there's these just behind-the-scenes, but no one has all the gifts, but we all have some of the gifts. Now, um, let me just kind of be clear where I stand. Uh, I believe uh, speaking in tongues and, and healing and all of those things, I believe those are just as valid today as they were in biblical times. Um, I, they're, they're, I believe they, they are valid gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, the problem we run into is when we think that we're not a Christian if we don't speak in tongues. Uh, and there, there are probably some that might feel that way. That's not scriptural. It's not, first of all, it's not scriptural. It's not true. Um, and the other, the other side of, of, of the gift of tongues is uh, not to feel, a, you know, somebody's not a Christian if they don't. And, and also we can sometimes manu try to manufacture a giftedness because we kind of like the D double light bulb or whatever, you know, we, we, we think that we've got to do this in order to be legit. So we manufacture things. So there's dangers on both sides of that, but we need to understand that uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, there's not some, oh, well, those, gosh, these were, this was just for biblical times. Uh, you know, that, that doesn't exist anymore. No, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I mean, he's, he, it's the same Holy Spirit that, that showed up at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the same Holy Spirit is here with us this morning. Amen. He's got the same giftedness. He's, he's got the same uh, uh, mission for us, uh, purpose for us. So through the, through the Holy Spirit, the believer gives gifts and power and the common good. Now, that, I want to talk a second about that common good. Now, the, the thing I tell people all the time is, I, I don't know about you, I want more of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I'm constantly in pursuit of that. I, I want that. I desire that. Give me more, God. Give me all that I can handle because I, I want it. And, and, and some people are afraid of that. They're like, you know, it, it kind of, 
you know, like, whoa, he's going to make me move to Africa or, you know, or I, again, I'm going to start rolling around on the floor, you know, or whatever. It's like the Spirit only wants good for us. Shake, shake your head if you're hearing what I'm saying. The Spirit only wants good for us. He, he doesn't want to embarrass us. He doesn't want to make us weird. I mean, he doesn't want any of that stuff. He, he wants us to be blessed, and he wants us to be effective in, in communicating the love of Christ, which leads me to the next point. Through the Holy Spirit, the believer demonstrates love for God and neighbor. Now, um, I spoke of this in that funeral I did last week that... Um, the gentleman's life that, um, uh, as I heard more and more about his life, um, it just, I mean, everybody was just talking about what, what a great guy this, uh, he was and all these different things, different attributes of his life and so forth. And what the scripture that came to my mind was Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Um, the fruit of the Spirit, meaning that, um, that we, uh, if the fruit of the Spirit proves our faith genuine. Okay, it, it proves our faith genuine, and I, and I use the example, and I've used it here before, that if you want to know what a pecan tree looks like, look for pecans. <laughs> if you're walking down the street, and you say, I think that's a pecan tree, and then somebody else go, well, it's pecan season, and I don't see any pecans. It's probably not a pecan tree. <laughs> so the fruit proves the tree genuine. And the fruit of the Spirit, when we have the Spirit living in us, we're going we're gonna, to uh, produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, and self-control. I mean, there's this, if, if we are filled with the Spirit, and that doesn't mean we're going to be perfect, and it doesn't mean we're never going to stumble and get angry or any of those kinds of things, but, it, but more or less, our life will exude the fruit of the Spirit. People will look at us and go, What's up with that girl? What's up with that? There's something different about that person. Because everybody else is panicking. Everybody else is, is in chaos. And I, I've told this story before, one of my favorite John Wesley stories. Um, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, um, he, the first part of his life, he thought that uh, being a discipline, he was all about the disciplines, prayer, scripture, service. I mean, he, you know, he, he thought being walking out the Christian faith was being a dis disciplined man of the faith. Uh, he, he was forgetting the spirit. And he's on a ship coming from England to, to America, and they run into a storm, and there's this, this group of Christians, the Moravians that were on the ship with him, uh, that, that knew about the spirit. And they run into this storm, and it's, I mean, literally they think, man, we're going down. This is it. And and I can just see it. John Wesley writes in his journal. He was freaking out. I'm not sure he used that language, but he was freaking out. And, he, and I can just see him running around the deck going, Ah, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. I mean, just see him. He was panicking. He's like, this is a man, strong man of the faith. And the Moravians are sitting over in the corner, and the, the waves are splashing on them and all this stuff, and they're singing Kumbaya. Probably didn't sing that exact song, but they're just singing worship songs. They're worshiping God, and they're it's just like, kind of like, well, this is it. We're, we know Jesus. We're, we're good. And when they, and they, they weathered the storm, and they got to, to shore and later, and, and John pulls them aside and says, what in the world? Why were you guys so calm? And they began to introduce him to the Spirit of God. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. So when the Spirit of God is in, in us, um, we produce the fruit of the Spirit. Now, um, one of the things, that, that word love, I want to I talk for a second about that word love because it's, it's really being um, messed up in our culture. Um, you, you hear all the why love is never wrong. Anybody ever heard that phrase? How could love be wrong? And we hear that when we're speaking on the, the sexuality issue and different things that our culture is fighting over and, and within churches are fighting over. And um, what we don't understand what love really is. We think love is always warm and fuzzy. We think, uh, I mean, I could tell you a lot of times when we, our definition of love is wrong. I mean, you know, if you, if you want to, somebody wants to marry their mom, you know, that's probably a, uh, and it's like, well, so, the so you, you could have the question, what, do you love her? 
I, I told this story a, a, a couple of years ago. I received a call from a, a man that I know that was not even part of our church, and he was married and had a family, and he's, he's attracted to this girl in his office, and he's thinking about having an affair, and he called me. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> so if I, if I were to take the definition of love of our culture, then my question to him would have been, well, do you love her? You know what my response was? Run. Put down the phone right now. Find what direction she's in. Turn around the other direction and run as fast as you can run. If you have to quit your job, whatever you have to do, go home and love your wife. Now, but our culture would say, would ask the question, well, maybe your love for your wife has grown cold. And this is who God's leading you to. No. No. When, I, when somebody, I did a wedding for Olivia. Y'all know our little college, a little, little Olivia last two weeks ago. And, and I told them when I was doing the premarital counseling, when they stood here before me and I was, I was reciting uh, the vows, it doesn't say I promise if. It says I promise. I'm making promises. And so, so love sometimes is not warm and fuzzy. Sometimes love is hard. Sometimes love takes commitment and covenant. And, and sometimes the most awesome way to, to demonstrate love was a man hanging like this. And I tell people, and I know it sounds really preachy, and I'm sorry, but it just, I guess I, I'm a preacher, so I'm supposed to sound preachy. But <laughs> Jesus wasn't warm and fuzzy when they nailed him to a cross. But it was the most loving thing that's ever happened in this, this entire world. So we demonstrate love, and love is a sacrificial, costly sometimes. It doesn't always feel good. It doesn't always make just the perfect sense. It's like, oh, well, gosh, you know, this, I really, I'm really looking forward to making that decision. No, sometimes it's costly. Jesus, it was so costly that Jesus in the garden sweat drops of blood, and we've talked about that. That's a medical condition where under enormous strain, enormous stress, the capillaries burst and blood mixes with the sweat. It's a physical condition. Look it up. Love is not always warm and fuzzy. But when we have the Holy Spirit in us, he allows us to love the way he loves. I've, I've prayed that sometimes. Someone I'm struggling with. I'm looking around to see if any of you are here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm struggling with a, with a person or a situation, I sometimes pray that, Lord... Let me see them the way you see them. Let me love them the way you love them. Let me forgive them the way you've forgiven me. Love is some not, sometimes not warm and fuzzy. Sometimes it's very difficult. You know, we, um, we as Christians, if you ever, if you ever get the question, uh, and, and this is a statement, Sometimes people make again in our culture uh, when they start looking at other religions and they go, well, it's the same God. You know, it's the same God. We just call him different, different things or whatever. Well, that's not true. We believe as Christians, we believe in the Trinity, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so, and so we've been talking about the Spirit um, part of that Trinity. But it's still the Holy Spirit is God. And Jesus is God. And, and all you got to do is open the word and read. And, and he proclaimed it. The disciples proclaimed it. Others proclaimed it. The early church historians proclaimed it. Jesus is God. Emmanuel, God made flesh, God among us, dwelling among us. And so Jesus, being God, being deserving of, of honor and prestige and worship, the night that he was betrayed, he, um, he washed the disciples' feet. He became their servant, setting us an example. And then he took the bread, and again, he, he, changed, he changed the script. And he, and he took the bread, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, 
my body broken for you. There's no longer, you know, the, the Jews at that point, they had been taking the, at the Passover meal, they'd been taking their, their most innocent, pure lamb and sacrificing the lamb. And that was, to them, that was costly. This is kind of my prize lamb here. Well, Jesus was God's prize lamb. And then he took the cup and it had always been this, this uh, the sacrifice of, of the blood of, of the lamb. Jesus was the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And, and he blessed it and he said, this, is, this cup is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. And it's poured out for you. So I want you to, as we, as we come into this time of communion this morning, it, it begins with, as, as uh, Peter preached that first sermon, he's, he's preaching the gospel. Here's, here's what's happened. Here's what's transpired with, with Jesus. And it says the people were convicted, and it says that, they, um, that they, their response was, what should we do? How, how do we respond? And, and Peter said, repent and be baptized. There's this, so, so coming to Christ and, and, and celebrating this meal, it begins with a heart of repentance. So if you just bow your head and just confess in your own mind, your own heart, where you have fallen short, short, In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Hi, this is Pastor Jeff Hatcher with Wiley United Methodist Church in Abilene, Texas. I want to thank you for listening to this, uh, this message from God's Word today. I want to remind you that you have a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ, and He came to set you free. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He did that by hanging on a cross in our place. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to I want to invite you to do that today. If you want to do that, just pray this prayer with me. Father, uh, I repent of my sins. I confess to you that I am a sinner. I ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart, to free me from my sin, to, to be my Savior and my Lord. Uh, help me to be the creation that you have, have created me to be in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today for the first time, I want to ask you to do four things. First of all, I want to ask you to, to share that decision with a member of the clergy. Let them know that you've made that decision. And secondly, I want, you, want to ask you to be baptized. God's Word says that uh, believers in Jesus Christ, we affirm that and we celebrate that through baptism. And thirdly, I want to ask you to begin to read God's Word to get into his word, not just because uh, we think that that makes us good, but because this is the word of life. And finally, to, to find a Bible-believing and preaching church to be a part of. If you've made that decision, I also welcome uh, a co conversation with you. You can reach me at jhatcher at wileymethodist.org, and I'd be happy to come along your side in that journey. God bless you.